Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And seeing the long-term impacts of climate change, Livestock, grazing, and enhancing the environment. This is a conundrum. It's also a question by many people in modern society that how do we actually bring that in balance? How do we balance actually having cattle, which many people say that we should all be going to vegetarian or veganism as a diet and a way of life. Others like to have uh, animal proteins, enjoy it. And yet still think that we can have animal proteins as well as protect and enhance the environment. So we have a gentleman that's going to be attesting to that right now. Keith Olinger, he's the owner of Porchview Farm. And we're going to talk about this rotational grazing, something that we've actually covered on Emerald Planet TV, but from the center of the African continent. And this is a, in a sense, similar process. So Keith, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Well, talking about uh, range-fed uh, cattle, sheep, uh, goats, pigs, ducks, chickens. I mean, you have just about everything on your farm. Uh, they all fit together very nicely. Uh, but how are you looking at the grazing and at the same time being able to enhance the environment? Well, we, we utilize what's called rotational grazing. And so we, we keep the livestock on a particular spot of land for just a short period of time. It ranges in our development on the farm from one day to about a week. Um, and then we move them. And what it does is it, it allows the grass to recover, but also if there's any pests that were, you know, part of the animal, uh, they come back up and they don't have a host, so they don't repopulate. So it cuts down on your medical bills. So it helps to increase your profits and it also helps the environment. And also it makes uh, just for uh, better uh, food that's coming from these animals at the same time, because you, again, as you were saying, you eliminate the chemicals, you're having to add many of these uh, very large scale feedlots. There's so many chemicals going into these animals that eventually it's coming over into the human food chain. And that's something we really do want to avoid. Uh, but looking at this uh, rotation of the cattle, how does this actually work? And we're looking at this uh, very interesting photograph and we'll see some of this, but just go through this with us. Well, in this picture, uh, at this point, what we were doing was we were rotating the animals every day. And so we would we would put up T-posts and, and cattle panels, which is what you see there. I'm opening that. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna let them into a new section of grass that they haven't grazed from a section that they had. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, we were doing it every day, right about now we're doing it about once a week. Um, and so then what they'll do is they'll be in there for, you know, about 24 hours. And while, while they're grazing, I'm putting up a new fence in this particular photo. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at them uh, moving in, you know, from uh, you call these paddocks, which uh, I lived in Australia and other uh, former English colony, so I know all about paddocks. Uh, but moving from one to the other, you're saying you're doing this on a one day rotation. That seems like a lot of work. Well, they will actually eat down about, you, you wanna leave a residue of about eight inches, six to eight inches um, so that the grass can recover quickly. Um, it can photosynthesis and, and do what it needs to do to recover quickly and get, get growing bigger again. But um, they'll eat about a two foot swath down to that level in a day. 
Um, so at this at this stocking rotation, we were we were pushing about what we'd say two hundred thousand pounds per acre in a day. And so you're way the amount of you're you're guesstimating the amount of cattle that you have on, and you're trying to keep it at that level. I see. Now, uh, looking at the fencing that you're using, uh, we we saw actually in that first photograph, you know, sheep and uh, the cows uh, on our pasture lands, we really never mixed uh, sheep and cattle together, but it seems like you're doing it. So what is the different rotation for uh, the sheep versus the cattle? And maybe even the hogs are in part of that rotation as well. Yes, we've, we've had combinations of cattle, sheep, hogs, and goats all at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we're running a rotation with the sheep and the cattle. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a matter of, it depends really, uh, depending on the time of year, the amount of rainfall you're getting, you're constantly watching what's happening with the animal health and what's happening with your grasses. And it, it becomes mere, mainly an art form. You have to kind of gauge. And when you see it getting to that point, then you pull them off so that you leave that six to eight inches of residue on there. Mm -hmm. So that really is the, the magic of this, is that they graze down to about six to eight inches of the surface of the ground, and then you want to be moving them into the next paddock. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, because you want enough of the plant left that, that it's still processing the sunlight. And if you graze it down too low, there's not enough grass there uh, to deal with that. Then it has to rob some of its reserves in the root system to, mm -hmm. to spark that growth. And if you get a drought that's poorly timed or something happens, it, you could damage your pastures. Yeah. Now, looking at this as far as uh, your chickens, I know that uh, saying chickens are range fed, uh, people kind of uh, smirk or laugh at that. But why is that so important along with having the larger livestock grazing together or in close proximity with each other? Well, in this picture, we're, we're using uh, electric fence to rotate our chickens, and that is an apple tree. And so there's a couple things that it does in the environment. One, any apple drops that fall can become a vector for disease and pests. Mm -hmm. When the chickens are in there, they can eat that, and they also spread the seeds. So that can help in many ways in that it, it gets rid of pests because they'll eat the, any type of larva, but also they'll eat the fruit, and then that takes away any sort of molds or fungus that could hurt the tree mm -hmm. for for when we do it with the livestock what happens is the chickens and the poultry because we have ducks and geese as well and we've used turkeys and guineas in addition but we don't have any right now they will come through and they will scratch out the manure pats they'll eat the the larva from the fly larva the maggots mm -hmm. and so it helps reduce down your your fly populations your pest populations and then it also helps to spread the manure which allows it to more uniformly soak into the soil when we do get the rains mm -hmm. we also have dung beetles and earthworms which process it once it's in once it's more on the ground level mm -hmm. yeah now this is uh, very interesting of course we're seeing uh, the cattle and uh, the other uh, animals grazing together here so the the cattle and the sheep the hogs uh, you know even the the fowl uh, they all have learned to live and let live, get along with each other. And actually, they really do sense that this is a symbiotic relationship. Yes. Yeah, so we we select animals that by nature are more friendly, I guess you want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, these are Irish Dexter cattle. And in the background, you see hog island sheep there. Um, and what we do is w this picture shows they're they're grazing right around where our kids play. Mm -hmm. um, so we we we've selected animals that, that that work very well together. And then we have a livestock guardian dog, uh, Great Pyrenees, that's in not in the photo, but but she's usually around them, uh, making sure any any predators that come in are chased off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I just really like this photograph. This is an incredible photograph. Tell us what we're looking at. You know the type of cattle. Uh, but why are this grasslands are so high? Well, it, it's it's all part of the system. By by leaving that eight to you know six to eight inches of growth, the plants recover so much quicker. They grow so much better by having the livestock in with the fertility that they're adding to that area. That helps the plants fertilize them and recover, and then it also helps to store moisture with the addition of the key lines that we have in the background, helping to drive that moisture into the sponge that becomes our soil. That helps keep the moisture cycle going so there's water there even in a dry period when the plants need it. And what you end up with is the case where when we turn 
livestock into a fresh paddock, sometimes they disappear because you lose them because the grass is so tall. <laughs> it, it really is a fantastic photograph. But I want to stay on this for just a minute. As far as weeds are concerned, uh, how having the grass this high, allowing the cattle to be in there, how are you controlling the weeds uh, when normally you think the weeds are going to be growing up right among all this vegetation? Well, one of the things our, our livestock have been trained to eat the weeds. So the quote unquote weeds, uh, a weed is defined as anything that's somewhere that you don't want it essentially mm -hmm. as a plant. And so uh, Canada thistle is a big one on our property. And so one of the things they've, they've been trained very early on through mob grazing, when you graze a large number of animals in a concentrated area, they become very territorial and they realize I need to get this food or, or someone else might eat it. <laughs> and so they slowly learn that they can eat these things. Um, and the fact that they're not in large concentrations. So we have we have some plants that are considered maybe toxic, such as milkweed. But milkweed are wonderful for the monarch butterflies. Right. Um, but it's not a pasture solely of milkweed. And so what happens is if an animal eats just a little bit of it, it's not going to hurt it. And we also believe that that helps control internal parasites with the livestock. Now, we don't have scientific proof of that, but other mm -hmm. folks that do what I'm doing believe that, that you know, 200 years ago, no one was, was giving animals shots like our vets do these days, and somehow they were getting what they needed from the environment. And we believe that some of these, these quote unquote, toxic species in small doses were actually therapeutic. And so right. that's how this kind of all works as a symbiotic relationship between the plants the microbes, the, the poultry, the, the wildlife, and what we've done with the trees and the silver pasture. Well, I'm going to say thank you for protecting the monarchs and the milkweed <laughs> because I'm on the board of Natural Partners. Oh, uh, We've had them quite a few times on here. We actually are part of the National Coalition protecting the flyways between Nova Scotia and the center of Mexico for the monarch mm. butterflies. And so anything you're doing there and the other farmers as far as protecting the milkweed uh, is very good. Now this gives you an idea as they're chewing and uh, eating the uh, the grasses down. Now it looks like this is just about when they're ready to move to a, a new paddock. Yes, and this also shows, uh, you can see there's some grass strands in front of this steer uh, and it shows just how high some of the warm season grasses that we've planted. Uh, we have some big blue stem and some little blue stem in this field among among four others. And by, by adding those warm season grasses, it gives us some climate resilience. So if we do get droughts where some of the cool season grasses may, may slow down or go dormant, the warm season grasses will continue to thrive and provide them forage. So uh, I, I thought this was a good picture showing just how high that grass is in relation to the animals. Right. Yeah, I think this is wonderful. This is moving it again. So uh, yes. as a summary, moving them paddock to paddock, uh, actually, it doesn't take that long to do this. Uh, no, it only takes a few seconds because after the, we leave the calves and the young sheep on their moms, we don't separate them. So we mm -hmm. don't officially have a weaning time. Um, and so what happens is, what I've found anyway, is that the younger animals, they, they learn by watching their mother. And mm -hmm. so by leaving them on, they slowly, as we move paddocks, repeatedly they come to realize oh well, this is what's going on and so mm -hmm. i have a special call for the sheep and a separate call for the cattle and mm -hmm. i'll use them in conjunction if i need to separate out the animals i'll do my special call for the sheep get them by the gate and they'll come through and then i can separate them out and then i can do the same with the cattle or i can move the whole herd of combined and they learn over time and then after a while they they know exactly what's happening and they're right at the gate ready to go well, it seems like they're lining up also to have a picnic on the back porch. So uh, yes. this is a great photograph, eating the cattle. What do you see for uh, this type of uh, cattle rotation over the next 5, 10, or 15 years? And be quick, just a few seconds. I truly, I truly think it's the future. I really believe that it's a better system, um, and it, it, it really helps the environment. And, and we do a lot to try and break down waste that gets sent to the landfills. And in this case, the local church had a lot of pumpkins left over. And so we took all the pumpkins and we fed them to the herd. So you've got goats and sheep and cattle in here eating those pumpkins. That's fantastic. Keith Olinger, Porchview Farm, as we create the Emerald Planet. Thank you.